Good. Well, thank you. That's very, that's very nice. Uh, I'm, I'm using the word uh, prepared very loosely this morning. I have some notes, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. I've definitely prepared. And, and one of the things that just, it helps so much knowing that, man, I, I love you guys. And you're my friends. And there's people here that just, like, to stand up here can be intimidating and scary. But because, like, man, I'm just talking to you. We're just having a conversation about Jesus about his love and, uh, man, his great compassion for us today. Uh, that's awesome. And so thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our online community for being here as well. Uh, we are so glad that you've joined us, and we hope that you can join us in person. And it is one thing to, to worship, but it's another thing to worship together as the body of Christ. So, um, man, I just have a couple of things, and congratulations, pop. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> and staff, hey, pop. Uh, I, I think maybe I'll refrain. Um, then I will, I will not be asked back to, to prepare and speak. But, uh, man, it is such an awesome thing to be here on staff at LifePoint. It is a fun environment, and we just, we do, man. We care very much about you, about our community, and, and know that today has been prepared for for you. Man, there has been prayer that has gone before. There are people that are surrounding this place and this time because they want you to know and experience the living God. And so uh, I want to just take a moment. Along our back wall, we have this thing that says, For God so loved, and there's a blank. Because we are really making a concerted effort to be intentional about sharing our faith. And doing this every year by, by praying for someone. By prayerfully considering who God is sending into our lives and who we can be faithful to share the gospel message with. And so along that wall, we have little rolled up pieces of paper. And there are some uh, at the point you can put the name of that person that you are going to pray for. You roll it up and, and like longwise like this. Don't like short. You're going to freak me out, man. But uh, so, so longwise, roll it up, slide it in there and, and pray for those people. And also, I mean, engage that back wall. It's not just to be a static display that's a reminder, but grab a name on your way by. Put it in your Bible for that week. Pray for that person. Bring it back and place it uh, in there so someone else can pray. This is a corporate effort that we are individually engaging, okay? So w let's take a moment. We're going to pray for all of those, and then would you just um, consider doing that this week as you walk out? But God, we do. We lift up every single name that is represented on those papers. And God, we are asking for breakthrough in their lives. We're praying for that thing of a heart of stone to replace, replace with a heart of flesh. And God, we are praying and asking salvation in Jesus' name for every single person on that wall. Would your Holy Spirit go before them and surround them? Send people into their lives who will not only sow, but who will, who will water and who will tend and will care for that thing until those seeds produce seeds and fruit of their own, God. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 So one last thing before I go into uh, our, our, our uh, scripture for this morning. I'm asking that you'd have an expectant heart. Because people have prayed because of this thing, man, we do not come just to observe on Sundays and to grab a little bit of something and have some cool worship Thank you, by the way, for entering in this morning. That was awesome. It's so amazing that this is not just a time of song, but it is a time of worship and connecting our hearts with God. So thank you for doing that. But come with expectant hearts. So uh, in the seat backs, there are pencils. There should be some paper. Uh, if you don't have paper, use the forehead next to you. Like, it, like God is going to speak into your life, and do not miss it. And he's not going to just speak a word, but it's going to be something that you can carry out and apply to the world that he has entrusted to you. So do that with an expectant heart this morning. Uh, I want to read out of Mark 11. Um, this is the triumphal entry. This is what we're celebrating. Happy Palm Sunday, by the way. Uh, this is the triumphal entry. entry. So we're going to start uh, in chapter 11 of Mark in verse 1. When they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and told them, go into the village ahead of you. As soon as they entered it, you will find a donkey tied there, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here right away. So they went and found a young donkey outside in the street, tied to a door. They untied it, and some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the donkey? They answered them just as Jesus had said, so they let them go. 
Then they brought the donkey to Jesus and threw their robes on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their robes on the road, and others spread leafy branches cut from the fields. Those who went ahead of those who followed, I'm sorry, those, then those who went ahead and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Let's pray this morning. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for today, that we get to call it today, that we are here. And Lord, I just, uh, I thank you for the fact that you still speak. Lord, that you are not silent or distant, but that you are near and you want to speak directly to our hearts today. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me all these things that, uh, that, that I have prepared. Lord, I pray that I would be out of the way, that we would hear your voice and we would hear what you would have for us in this day and this time. You have given it to us as a unique gift, God. And we love you. We thank you. It's your name we pray. Amen. 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 So today I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the king that we want versus the king that we need. And uh, we're going to look at two passages of scripture and then uh, also talk about just kind of our, our personal context, what this looks like us for us today in this day and this age. And so uh, I do want to talk about uh, just how, how we even kind of apply God in certain ways. And, and really, this is a human problem. This is not just something that happened to these people in the Bible. Um, but I want to start out and just kind of talk about this thing of, of want versus need. Come with me. On a trip through time, back to 1990. All right, so 1990 feels like all of a sudden a long time ago. It wasn't that long. So those of you who are, are junior hires and high schoolers, uh, thank you for coming back in. It's good to see you. Uh, and 1990 wasn't that long ago, okay? Okay. So 1990, October 31st of 1990. Uh, I was a part of a church, and we had a youth choir that was about 80 kids strong, and we were practicing this uh, this kind of, um, it's like a, a musical play thing that we were able to take into local high schools. And so I had a solo, and at the time I'm a freshman in high school, and I had a beautiful soprano voice. It was awesome. Uh, so it took me a while to like get some height. And, anyway, so I have this, uh, this solo, and I get up to sing, and I'm feeling worse by the minute. And so I get up to sing, and I croak out like two semi sort of notes. And the director looks at me like, oh, you idiot. And I'm just like, I gotta go. So I sit down on the front row, and she finally comes over, and she goes, man, you do not look good. And so um, she said, why don't you go call your parents and have them come and get you? And so, again, for, for your junior high and high schoolers, so I had to walk somewhere else to go get a phone because it was connected via wire to another wire that went to another wire that my parents then picked up. And, uh, and I said, man, I, I think you need to come get me. I'm just not feeling well. So um, my dad shows up. And like already that's odd. My dad just, just typically worked uh, later at night. And so that I had called my mom, but my dad came. I'm like, that's kind of strange. And so uh, he pulls up in our gold Ford Fiesta. And uh, I get in the passenger seat. And I'm just ready to go home. And we start to pull away, and I notice that we're not headed home. And I said, Dad, man, I just, I really, I just want to go home. I want to lay down. I just want to feel better. He said, yeah, you're, you're going to the hospital. I don't want to go to the hospital. He said, I have a feeling it's your appendix. And I said, I don't know what that is, but I don't care. I would really just, I, I want to go home. So we go to the emergency room, and uh, they, they, you know, they, they push on my abdomen, sending me through the roof. And uh, so they're confirming all these things. And they have me change into a hospital gown. And the general surgeon is going to come in. And um, I mean, I'm already kind of embarrassed. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm in a hospital gown. And in walks a female general surgeon. I'm a 14-year-old boy. I'm like, this is not, I'd rather die. I would now rather die. Please, Father, just let me die. And, uh, and so. Uh, it comes, yes, sure enough, man, it is my appendix. They roll me into surgery, um, and before, this is like, this is the worst, because uh, the next morning, I just signed papers that said, like, you could die, and uh, now I'm thinking maybe death wasn't so great, so, uh, so then I'm sitting there, I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling all these things, and the youth choir decides to come and pray for me 
in my hospital gown. And like, I'm not concentrating on a single thing they're thinking. I'm just like, I'm naked. So it's, it's so it's awful. I, I wanted nothing to do with this thing anymore. And uh, so once I get through surgery and I wake up and I'm feeling so much better, and now I'm in a spot to recognize that what I wanted and what I needed were very different things. My current circumstance and my current pain that I was experiencing put me in a spot where I wanted to go home and to rest and whatever. But my dad, because his perspective was outside, looking in at the whole situation and at the future that was going to like, be there before me, he had the perspective to come and say, look, I actually know what you need. And we're going we're gonna to put aside what you want because the future is better if you will listen to what you actually need. So this is illustrated in, in, in this story of Palm Sunday very, very well and really on a, on a much grander scale. And so when we look at this thing, we can see that the Israelites of that time had a very narrow perspective based on their circumstances, based on their current perception of pain and reality. And so uh, as, as we look, I want to take a look at actually the four instances that this is recorded in the Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each one of these tells the story of the triumphal entry, and they have kind of a, a different little bit of a bent on this story that tells just a little bit more of where those people were at. So in Matthew 21, 5, as they're setting this, this whole thing up, it says, tell daughter Zion, see... Your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And the Old Testament verse this is referencing comes out of Isaiah and Zechariah. And they actually talk about how salvation is coming in this moment. They're talking about this thing of salvation. And so the people obviously have this, this, this rich history of scripture, of scripture memorization. They have the law and the prophets. And when they're hearing salvation, they're applying it very narrowly to their own circumstances. And right now they're under the rule of Rome and they see Rome and Caesar as the oppressor. And they are saying, okay, we need salvation. And this is what salvation looks like for us. In Mark 11, 8 through 9, it says, Many people spread their robes on the road, and others spread leafy branches cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed. I want to read that again. Those who went ahead and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. The coming kingdom of our father David is blessed. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And the cool thing is, like, man, they are proclaiming truth. They are, they, are, they are quoting scripture from before that speaks of this very moment, and they're speaking truth. But the problem is, is they're still applying it. They're misapplying it in a number of areas. And this isn't just something that, that they're kind of hiding. And, I mean, they, they have now come out fully into the open with a proclamation that Jesus is going to be this salvation. So we're not talking about, like, some little moment where some guy's hanging out of a window like, hey, uh, Jesus, hey, good job, man, I'm behind you. I mean, like, we're talking about people coming before, going before him and coming after him, shouting and continually shouting. So this is not something that's hidden or something that's even kind of like a little bit out in the open. This is fully wide open now in full view of everyone. And even as they speak about it, it says, the coming kingdom of our father David, we still have this, this picture that they're thinking, uh, of this earthly king. They're thinking of someone who's in the lineage of David, not because it's going to foretell uh, or because of the prophecies the, of where the Messiah will come from, but that he is going to establish a kingdom like David's. So they're, they're not even looking at this, this thing. Jesus has talked for these three years of his earthly ministry about the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is this. The kingdom of heaven. And they're still like, okay, the kingdom, uh, David's kingdom, yeah, our father David. And they're, they're missing this connection to God the Father, his kingdom of heaven that Jesus is actually ultimately trying to point them toward. Right. So it's that thing again of, of this narrow perspective of the here and now versus an eternal perspective that Jesus is trying to, to remind them and bring them into to teach them about. In Luke 19, 37 through 40, it says, Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives. The whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully 
with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. The king who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And this is, is even more explicit. Now, they're actually pro proclaiming and pronouncing out in public where there, there are sure to be Roman soldiers, Roman guards, uh, all these different people from, uh, from the Roman community. And they're now saying, hey, this is the king. This is the king who's coming. And then in John, it says, uh, the next day when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and they went out to meet him. And they kept shouting, Hosanna, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one, the king of Israel. So that's even more explicit. Not just, not just that he's a king. He's going to be our king. And we're going to establish because here he comes. And so as we're looking at this, I have to, I have to think that, that there, were, there were those in the crowd that probably were thinking he's going to have some sort of like bait and switch moment because he's on a donkey but they're like wait no but he's coming to be the conqueror so we're going to overthrow Rome and so they're kind of like he, 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 he. here it comes and they're aligning themselves with Jesus because they're thinking one direction they're thinking that he is going to relieve them of the pressure that they're under from the Romans to then be elevated so that they're no longer on the bottom of the heap but they're on top and they're looking at this because of, uh, of, of a, a number of things. And we see that they're ready to praise and they're ready to shout and exalt and point and go, man, that's our guy, that's our guy, until their guy gets arrested and put on trial. And they scatter and they're gone. So we, we see that, that this, this misunderstanding, when it, when it came to the point that there's a recognition like, okay, this isn't quite going like we had planned, that, they, that they're now lost. Their perspective is gone. Their understanding of who Jesus is, like it's all up for grabs again. And they flee. We even see uh, Peter, who, who's called the rock. And he, I mean, he's like, he's got strong opinions. And he's not afraid usually to stand up and do things until this moment. And he denies Christ three times. And, and it is, it is and, and, and with like strong language, he's even saying distancing himself because he's really not sure of what's going on what they needed was surrendered hearts what they wanted was a king who would rule in a way that put them back in a, uh, a position of authority and headship what they needed though were surrendered hearts they needed to trust even in the midst of confusion and they needed to surrender their expectations and what if, like, what if Jesus had been that temporary king? Like, let's say he even lived 75 years beyond that, and he was a great king and, and whatever. Like, where does that put us? Where does that put us? He had built this thing, like, God had already seeded in Abraham this thing that the nations, not just Israel, the nations would be blessed through him. And yet the people of Israel are like, man, I, I got to get mine. I got to get mine. I want my stuff. I want my... my for me right now. But if Jesus had only come for that, we would still be left on the outside. We would not have been grafted in. And so this, this narrow perspective, and Jesus telling them over and over again during his time, look, this is bigger. This is bigger than you. I've come that people will be set free. Like, this is my heart. And, and it, it, we would have been still on the outside had Jesus just been who they wanted him to be instead of who they needed, who we needed him to be. They were looking at the oppressor being Caesar, not the devil. Caesar didn't need to be defeated. Hell and the grave and death needed to be defeated. And that's what was won in that moment. And that's the incredible thing, is that what they wanted versus what they needed, what they needed was that eternal outside perspective of, look, this is about health for everyone. This is about the life that I will bring, and it will be life more abundant than anything that you can imagine and think about right now. We also see this, and I, and, and, I mean, it's, it's easy to stand on this side of history all the time, right? And like, man, what a bunch of dorks. They should have seen it. But 
And, and honestly, like, as, as they're reading the Old Testament and they even look at the history, we look at the people of Moses' time. So, like, for them to be looking for a physical reality in the here and now, for them to be delivered out of something or to be delivered into a spot um, of, of health, wholeness, and all that kind of stuff uh, was, was not, like, it, it's, it's hard to blame them for it because they had seen this before as God had brought the people out of Egypt into the promised land. But then if we look at that, the people of Exodus were doing the exact same thing. They had their wants, and God had what he needed for them and what he wanted for them. And so if we look at, uh, at the story of Exodus, and it's, it's wild. Like As I've been going through um, Bible in the Year chronologically, the number of times that the Exodus story is told is not just in Exodus, but it's in Numbers and Deuteronomy. And they continue, Moses continues to say, hey, don't forget. Don't forget. God brought you out of this. You're a stubborn people. You're going to forget, so don't forget. Build these me uh, memorials and mem um, monuments in your life. Don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget. But they forget. And, like, they're, they're hardly even out of Egypt, and they're forgetting. Because they have this thing of what they want. They want control. They want to be able to have control over their circumstances and over their life. And so we see that, that they, like months, weeks to months after they have been delivered out of the hand of Pharaoh, out of oppression, and we're talking like real crazy stuff. Pharaoh ordering the death of their baby boys, like throw them in the Nile, like awful, awful stuff. They're delivered miraculously through the seas, uh, for the, through the Red Sea. And within weeks and months, Moses goes up on the mountain, and the mountain is filled and covered with smoke and fire and all this stuff. The people beg Aaron for a golden calf. Hey, we, they, they said, we don't know what happened to Moses. We don't know. What, what happened? Maybe he's not coming back. We need something to worship and like, I mean, God's right there before them. And they're like, ah, well, I don't know. So they build this golden calf. And then when that's destroyed and they're still wandering in the desert, they plot to kill Moses and Aaron because they want to go back to Egypt. And what do they cite? Cantaloupe and meat in their pots. Hey, we, do you remember the melons? Do you remember the melons in Egypt? Man, that was so good. Hey, remember how they killed our kids? No, 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 the melons, so juicy. And we had meat in our pots. And God's like, oh my goodness, it's so crazy. It's nuts, but it's the human condition. It's the human condition. And we can't forget that. We can't neglect that when we look at our own lives. And so here we have God, and he's promising them a land flowing with milk and honey, vineyards that are already planted, olive trees are ready to go, houses are already built. He's going to drive out the enemy before them. Like, he's already saying, like, look, you don't have to worry about victory. I'm going to give you the victory. I'm going to drive out these people before you. But what did they want? They wanted that control. A golden calf doesn't require much of you. A golden calf doesn't require anything. They had all these known variables. Okay, well, we don't know. We haven't seen this promised land with our own eyes, but we know Egypt. We know we had some food there that we liked. So, man, we'll, we'll go back and we'll be enslaved. So uh, thanks for the offer, but we're going to go back to what we know. What they needed as well were surrendered hearts. They needed to accept God's invitation of love they needed to trust that his heart for them was good. And they needed to trust that his moral law was meant to bring life and prosperity, not oppression and rules. And as we read the Old Testament, man, there's a lot of bizarre stuff in Leviticus. Like it's a head scratcher. But as you look at the actual theme, Old Testament rules are really about, hey, God's saying, hey, look, look, this unchecked, this is, this is going to actually ruin your life. And, and if that goes unchecked, this is going to spread to the rest of the community and ruin them as well. And this moral law has not passed away. There are so many things in our own hearts, in our own lives. God say, hey, look, look, 
This isn't about me giving you rules and regulation. I'm not trying to ruin your fun here. I'm saying that this is going to ruin your heart and your life. And if you, and if you don't keep this in check, and it's going to ruin everything around you as well. So what is our current circumstance? We definitely need surrendered hearts. We need to accept God's invitation of love. We need to trust that his heart for us is good. And sometimes it's hard in our own circumstances. Again, it's that thing of when we look back at these ancient people, it's easy to create some distance there. And, and I, I, mean, I grew up in the church, and I think some of those stories can just take on the air of a story. When you have the flannel graph and you have these little characters and puppets, it can be very much like, oh, I, I don't understand. I don't, I don't relate to the way they dress and, and these things that they're doing. But when we look at the heart and what God is really driving at, we see that, man, this is us. We're, this is our story just as much as it, is, as it is theirs. And he has something to say to us about how we approach him in this time and in our lives because he does not want these things to go unchecked. And so I have a, a couple of things I would like to illustrate. And, and I want to put this out to you and for you to, to, to begin to ponder and just see maybe how we are acting like the God that we want is on the throne instead of the God who he is and the God that we need. Do we often serve God and view him more like a president? Do we complete a mental checklist and performance evaluation based on our health, finances, and relative comfort before electing him to another term in our lives? Sometimes it can be that way. When things are going great, we're like, man, he's the king. And then when things are not going so great, we're like, man, I don't know. He, he may, maybe it's not real. Maybe it may have been hoodwinked. Instead of looking beyond our circumstances and trusting and putting our faith in him to be who he says that he is. Amen. Many times, too, we have a propensity to, 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 to almost say, almost like a, like a little goldfish. Instead of, man, this is my king who I reverence and awe. Like, hey, man, this is... This is my king. Uh, isn't he neat? I've got him all contained in this little bowl right over here. And sometimes if I'm feeling anxious or lonely, I just sit down and oh, it brings me comfort just to watch him swim around. But then I can just walk away and close the door. And he's just there. And also within our lives today, man, everything is customizable, right? Like you can't go to Starbucks and just get a coffee. Like it has to be like 75 ingredients long and it's going to be this and that and this temperature and every single thing that we order or get. And there, there are um, fast food restaurants, right? Have it your way. It's going to be yours. You can customize this. And then when you buy a vehicle, there's like thousands of trim options now. And then aftermarket parts, and you can make it just like you want it. And I think we treat God like this far too often. And I, I like his grace and his mercy. I'll take that. I'll take his grace and his mercy. And hey, what about his righteousness, his holiness, and his call for you to be righteous and holy? Ah, uh, that's, that's nice. Yeah, but this is the God I want. I want this package over here. Right, but what you need, what you need is the full thing. And you can't have one without the other. That's, that's fine. But, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this God. I'm going to go live my life the way I want. And so these, these aspects, man, how, how do we then have perspective? How do we gain this, this very important aspect of not just grabbing onto the, the attributes and aspects of God that we want, but actually enthroning him in our lives as he is and knowing that that is truly what we need? I would like to illustrate this. This is what's possible with just a glimpse of Jesus, with just a glimpse of heaven. This is an excerpt from a book called Everything Sad is Untrue. And it's an incredible book. I highly recommend it. And just to give you a little bit of perspective on uh, this, this section that I'm about to read, uh, it is a memoir, and it's written by uh, a guy who was... Um, a refugee. He and his parents lived in Iran around the time of uh, the Gulf War. And um, his whole family was there. They were very well off. 
His mom and his dad uh, were, were incredible in his life. And uh, then his mom, on a trip to see one of her relatives in England, met the person of Jesus Christ. And it radically, radically transformed her. And uh, she lost everything. There was a price put on her head in Iran. Her husband got her to the airport, but divorced her and would have nothing to do with her anymore. And she and her kids ended up finding asylum in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Iranians during the Gulf War in Oklahoma. One of the most welcoming to refugees, I'm sure, ever, right? So this, this just kind of sets this thing up. And I have read this like 50 times, and I keep crying. So forgive me if I don't make it through, but it's awesome and powerful. So let, let me read this to you. And again, this is a picture of what's possible when we don't just have um, a religion and when we don't just kind of treat God as a, a side note to our life, but as we put him in his rightful place as king. He says, my mom read about Jesus and became a Christian too. And not just a regular one who keeps it in their pocket. She fell in love. She wanted everyone to have what she had to be free. To realize that in other religions you have rules and codes and obligations to follow to earn good things. But all you had to do with Jesus was believe he was the one who died for you. And she believed. When I tell the story in Oklahoma, this is the part where the grown-ups always interrupt me. They say, okay, but, but why? Why did she convert? Because up to that point, I've told them about the house with the birds in the walls, all the villages my grandfather owned, all the gold, my mom's own medical practice, all the amazing things that she had that we don't have anymore because she became a Christian. All the money that she gave up, so we're poor now. But I don't have an answer for them. How can you explain why you believe anything? So I just say what my mom says when people ask her. She looks them in the eye with the begging hope that they'll hear her, and she says, because it's true. Why else would she believe it? It's true, and it's more valuable than seven million dollars in gold coins, and thousands of acres of Persian countryside, and 10 years of education to go to medical degree, and all your family, and a home, and the best cream puffs of Jolfa, and maybe even your life. My mom wouldn't have made the trade otherwise. If you believe it's true that there is a God and he wants you to believe in him and that he sent his son to die for you, then it has to take over your life. It has to be worth more than everything else because heaven's waiting on the other side. That or my mom's insane. There's no middle. You can't say like it's a quirky thing she thinks sometimes because she went all the way with it. She had all that wealth, the love of all those people she helped in her clinic. They treated her like a queen. And she's poor now. People spit on her on buses. She's a refugee in places people hate refugees, with a husband who hits harder than a second degree black belt because he's a third degree black belt. And she'll tell you, it's worth it. Jesus is better. That's a picture of what lordship looks like. What it is to look beyond our present circumstances and comfort into building the kingdom of God. This is also a picture of what it is to trade what is temporal for what is eternal. Everything, everything here is going to pass away. Only kingdom work will last forever. Sharing our testimony, spending time with Jesus to get to know him for him, and singing like you did this morning. And that is investment in eternity because what you are doing is shoring up your heart and saying, Jesus, you are who you say you are. You rose from the dead. You gave life and life more abundant when you are doing those things. And, and this is the power. Like when we take ourselves outside of this thing of like, man, I'm doing a devotion just like so I can get through the day. But when we do our devotions, knowing that we are spending time with the risen Savior, that he is alive, and that we are actually investing in a relationship that goes far beyond anything that this world has to offer. And we are investing in eternity. 
when we are investing in our homes, in our lives, with our wives and our husbands and our kids, when we are giving them Jesus moments and pointing them to a Savior, and that is eternal. As we go out from this place and as we share the hope that we have in us, that we don't just keep it in our pocket and we take it out every once in a while and rub it for good luck and we put it back, but when it transforms our lives and when we share that with others, and that is what lasts. And what the world says, all these things that they claim are life, it's going to be burned up one day. And we'll be left with what is true. And what is true is Jesus Christ. We have faulty thinking and corrupted hearts. God's invitation is to live, to truly live. Like this is the whole theme right now, live again. Because what the, the world says is living, in, and we even see the Israelites in the Old Testament, they're like, okay, what's living? Uh, living is melons and meat. No. Okay, next, Israelites in the New Testament, what's living? Oh, living, if we could just have victory over Caesar, we could really live. No. And the author's relatives, and oftentimes we see living as accessing the riches of this world. Man, what could I do with this amount of money? What could I do with this thing? What could I do? That's life. This is, but it's, it's an absolutely awful imitation. It's a horrible counterfeit to what's truly being offered to us and what's available to us. And just like this woman... And it impacted her life, not because of some, some little words or whatever, but she fell in love with Jesus Christ. This is key. This is key to having him in his rightful place. We have to fall in love with him, for him. Not as we want him to be, but as he is. Because as we fall in love with him, we'll learn to trust his heart. And the cool thing is, is that he already loves us. Like, he already loves us. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to earn his love. He's not on the outside like, well, I don't know. It was okay, but like you're a little off key. So and then oh, I love you now. Oh, that's so good. That's not how he operates. In Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8, it says the Lord was devoted to you and chose you, not because you were more numerous than all peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But why? Because the Lord loved you. And he kept the oath he swore to your fathers. Man, what an incredible picture. It is not because of our stature, our status, the things that we have to offer God that he loves us. He loves us because he loves us. In Deuteronomy 30, it says this, but the message or the word, like that's a whole other awesome thing right there, the word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart so that you may follow it. See, today I have set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. And the world, they're, they're going to want to say, hey, man, you kind of have these two, they're, they're both good choices. I mean, like, if you want, God, that's fine. It's good for you. I'm glad it makes you happy. But, like, they're kind of equal. And he's saying, no, 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 it's, there's a stark contrast. There's life and prosperity, which God is offering us in its fullness or there is death and adversity. Had the Israelites gone back to Egypt, death and adversity, death and adversity, like all day long. But life and prosperity was waiting in the promised land. And similarly, in, in, uh, further down in, in Deuteronomy 30, it says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and a curse. What do you want you to do? Choose life. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live Love the Lord your God. Obey him and remain faithful to him. And check this out. Why? For he is your life. He is your life. He will prolong your life in the land the Lord swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we have an even bigger promise that it, it is now that he is seated, uh, seated at the right hand of the Father and that we can be co-heirs with Christ in those areas that heaven is waiting on the other side of this, and everything worth investing in has to do with eternal significance, not our own comfort and our own circumstances being alleviated. So how? And there's some practical steps that we can do. And we read his word. We read his word because he is the word. 
And as we read and we understand, and every time that we go to this, we say, man, Jesus, I want to spend time with you. Would you reveal yourself to me through your word? Through prayer, as we pray, and sometimes prayer can seem difficult and weird because it's like he's, he's I, don't, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of things that I think the, the enemy would like us to think about prayer that just aren't true. But man, in that conversation with him, and Jesus, man, help my heart. Help me to believe. Help me in my unbelief. Would you reveal yourself to me? And he will. He will be faithful to do that. And as Pastor Mike and Jesse have been teaching us over these past few weeks, I encourage you, uh, listen to those messages. They are available online. But as they've been teaching about this thing of how we, we reach the world around us and the boldness that it takes, the revelation of God comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. It comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is understanding of how and, and how we can have more, it came alive and can come alive in our lives just like the disciples and just like these people who were completely confused and began to compromise because they didn't have the, per, the cr- proper perspective when Jesus was arrested, but now he's alive. He's visiting them. The Holy Spirit comes upon them and they don't care about this life anymore. All they care about is the kingdom and planting seeds and going and doing. And they, they die in the most horrific possible ways. But their eyes were set on the kingdom that was eternal, not the kingdom that was temporal. This is a daily pursuit. When we honestly assess our surroundings and we surrender our hearts, he begins to produce in us what's needed. When we establish him and we say, God, in my life, where are those areas that I'm just asking for what I want instead of what you truly need me to have in my life? Lord Jesus, reveal to me those places that I am not surrendered to you. When we begin to do that, then he will produce in us what is needed. We will establish him on the throne of the king as he is, not as we want him to be not as we want him to be. And this, this thing is available to you right now. And as we begin to, to wrap this service up, I want to just say, if you are here in a spot today where you don't know if Jesus is, is for you, does he love you? Have you gone too far? Is this, the, man, it is available to you. It is available to you. He wants a deep and intimate relationship with you. He has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not, not just that it's on the outside and that we're trying to chase after, but there's an intimate, amazing, incredible thing that happens when we render our hearts to him and say, come in fullness in my life. Amen. And remember, it is not because of what you can do, but God loves you first. Jesus loves you. He wants to be with you, and he wants nothing more than a life that is full and rich and full of prosperity. And he has set before you life and prosperity. And you can put behind you the life of death and confusion and slavery if you will offer it to him. Ask him to reveal that to your heart, to your eyes, that you will see the world for what it is and see him for who he is. So would you bow your heads with me this morning? And if you are in that spot, know that Jesus is waiting. He has come all the way. All you need to do is reach out to him. And if that is you this morning, would you do me a favor? Would you raise your hand and say, I would like to start that relationship with Jesus this morning. I'm ready to give the lie that the world has to offer and accept his kingdom of life and prosperity. And if you are here today and there's that that thing in your life where we often just have him in our pocket. We don't display him fully. And we have not enthroned him fully as the king. We've had that thing of picking and choosing. And I would just just ask you to, to pray. 
ask his forgiveness and ask him to come and be enthroned in your heart as the king that he truly is. And so God, we, we do, we ask, we ask that, that we would be a transformed people Lord, that we would not look to the things of this world, that we would trade all the garbage that is offered to us by this world in exchange for what you have for us in eternity. Lord, that every single moment of every single day, Lord, we would have surrendered hearts and minds, that we would not spend our time and spin our wheels doing things that don't matter, but that we would have a kingdom perspective, that we would be setting ourselves up, Lord, in relation with you, Lord, that we would build a relationship with you, Lord, for that will last. We get to spend eternity with you. May we not waste this moment in time on anything else. And God, we pray that there would just be a strength that comes upon us. Lord, that as we go and as we invite people to, uh, to this, this Easter service, Lord, and the thing that it represents because your death and your resurrection was the price that was paid so that we could live free. And your blood was shed so that we could have this new covenant that we can come in to your presence, clean and whole. Not because of us, but because of your great love. Lord, we pray that we would be surrendered fully to you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for that word.